I came across this video from NASA claiming that they were going to fly a drone on Mars. My immediate thought was, uh, no, because Mars has about one hundredth the atmosphere of Earth. So how are they going to fly in an atmosphere that thin? Now, I've called out NASA when they've come out with bullshit before, most notably when they claim that they found arsenic based life. Well, a mysterious NASA press release sparking major attention. They're holding a press conference this time tomorrow afternoon to announce, quote, an astrobiological finding that will impact the search for evidence of extraterrestrial life. And so what we think is happening, what our, our, all the evidence we've collected suggests, is that instead of these, we'll see these, these orange, light orange balls disappear. And represented by green balls, we see that arsenic would be substituting for phosphorus in the backbone of DNA. And you can see how critical this component of the DNA might be. Turned out, uh, they just kind of analyzed some dirty samples. <laughs> yeah, who would have seen it coming? Now, it's got to be said that I've taken a look at some of NASA's early landing on Mars type sequences and thought, not a chance in hell. Now, sure, I never made a video on it or anything. But that's what I was thinking. There was just so many things that had to happen correctly in sequence. It was just crazy. So take, for instance, Spirit and Opportunity. After six months in space, the first thing that you have to do is hit this incredibly narrow atmospheric window and lose some speed. Then you deploy a parachute and lose the heat shield, descend on a rope, inflate some airbags, fire the retros at exactly the right altitude in a second specific window then bounce around for a bit, deflate the airbags, maybe right the tetrahedron, and then have the rover unpack itself, sufficiently unbumped by all of the knocks that it's had, that it actually rolls off the platform in a functioning form. And I took a look at that and thought, no way, there's just so many things to go wrong. And I think that was in the back of NASA's mind too, which is why they sent two of them. However, no, both worked flawlessly. Then, some years later, came the Curiosity rover, which was a big boy, and used something called Sky Crane to lure itself to the surface via a sort of rocket suspended platform. Now, these achievements are very impressive because of the technical challenges of packing everything that you need onto a rocket and leaving it there for the best part of a year, and then timed to the second everything has to go right on Mars because none of this can be joysticked, if you like. It's all got to be automated because, at best, it takes about four minutes to get a radio signal to Mars and four minutes for the return, so that's about eight minutes. Or at its worst, when Mars is on the other side of the sun, it takes about 40 minutes to get a reply from Mars. So all of this has to be automated. Which brings us to flying an automated drone on Mars. Yeah, I'm skeptical about this one. The principal problem is that Mars doesn't have much atmosphere. So how are you going to produce the lift to get this off the ground? Hell, to get an atmosphere this thin on Earth, you have to go up about three times the height of Everest. Now, you are actually helped out a bit by the fact that Mars is significantly smaller than Earth and only has about one third of the gravity. So you only have to produce about one third of the thrust to get something airborne. However, getting one third of the thrust from one hundredth of the atmosphere is challenging. More on that in a moment. Even more challenging is this isn't like landing where it's got to go right once. This has to go right again and again and again because it's going to fly multiple times with obvious challenges like the wear and tear to the rotors. And as every drone pilot will tell you, once these things crash and they fall over, they don't take off again, right? You actually have to stand them up before they will fly again. That's easy enough to do when you're on Earth, but it must gotta be one of the most infuriating things ever to have a drone fall over on Mars, because it's gonna be an awful long time before anyone can stand it up to fly again. Right, so to get the thrust, helicopters typically angle their blades, and then they swing them through the air, batting the air molecules downwards, and this produces thrust upwards. And of course, it sort of slows the air down by some of the friction with the air there. And you're going to produce the most thrust when the blades are pitched at about 45 degrees. You know, with this very simplistic model. In reality, of course, those air molecules are moving around like crazy. This is actually a molecular dynamic simulation of air. So, the blue stuff is nitrogen. And that makes up about 80% of our atmosphere. 
The red stuff is oxygen, which makes up about 20% of our atmosphere. <laughs> That's the stuff that you really need to breathe to keep alive. And yeah, it's only one fifth of our atmosphere. And then there's about 1% of argon. They're the pink balls. And also there's a small amount of water in there from the humidity in the air. But for this example, I'm just gonna have the air molecules are sitting there in a static fashion. So it, it's clearer how these things typically produce thrust. The faster you spin the blades, the more lift you generate. And the lower the air pressure, the less air molecules the blade hits and the less lift it creates. Now, many of you will know that helicopters can't fly very high, but this is a combination of two factors. First of all, the rotors simply can't spin fast enough. And more importantly, there isn't enough air to run the engines. Just like people need that oxygen to burn fuel and create energy. Engines need oxygen to burn fuel and create thrust. So as you go up and the atmosphere becomes thinner, the oxygen content of the air becomes less. And eventually it gets so dilute, you just can't run an internal combustion engine on it. Thankfully, this isn't a problem with small electric craft. Electric engines don't need that oxygen to burn fuel to create thrust because they've got all the energy they need in the batteries. In principle, the only thing that limits how high an electric helicopter can fly is if it can mechanically spin the blades fast enough in the thinning air. Yes, unless, of course, you actually need the air for cooling. But that's a different story. Now, at this point, you might be saying, hey, if this is all true, why don't we have electric helicopters or electric planes? The simple answer is batteries suck as a way of storing energy with something like 40 times less energy density than gasoline. You know, when your typical airliner is 30% by mass gasoline, there is simply no way you could pack that much energy into batteries. And even if you could, they would be so insanely dangerous that you would never put them on an aircraft. So let's just say for an example that the revolutions per second you need to produce thrust to fly on Earth with this drone is one at one atmosphere. If you go up to where there's half of the atmosphere, the blades need to spin twice as fast to produce the same lift. And if you go up to where there's one hundredth of the atmosphere, you need to spin the blades about 100 times as fast. Now that's most notably a problem in the forces that it's going to put on the bearings and the blades. So on Mars, we're helped out a bit by the fact that there's only one third of the gravity on Mars that there was on Earth. So we only need to maybe spin the blades 30 times faster. And of course, you can make the blades much bigger so you don't have to spin them as fast. So how fast do the blades have to spin to produce lift? They have to spin at about uh, 2400 RPM to provide lift. So how would 2400 RPM, say, compare to a regular RC helicopter with about the same blade length? So the RPM that they're looking at isn't that far off what you can get off a regular remote control helicopter with comparable blade length. So the numbers that they're looking at really aren't that inaccessible here. It looks like what they've mostly done is hugely increase the surface area of the blades such that they don't have to get crazy RPMs out of the rotors. And it's going to be a fascinating craft that probably won't be able to fly on Earth at all, anywhere outside of the vacuum chamber where they test it. Kind of like the lunar lander could only land on the moon. It couldn't actually land on Earth. Now, NASA claims they've had mock-ups of these things flying in a vacuum chamber at about the right pressure, and I can believe that, even if the thing is clearly tethered by a safety wire. Now, NASA's specs of this thing is it's gonna weigh about a kilo. And the mass, the total mass, including everything, the rotors and everything it has to live, and the camera, everything, is approximately one um, kilogram. Which is very comparable to a drone that they have on the DJI website. So this commercial drone weighs about one kilo. What sort of power does it need to fly? Well, the battery carries some 68 watt hours of power, which is about one quarter of a million joules, and will run for about 23 minutes, which is about 1,400 or so seconds. Meaning that while this thing is in the air, it's pulling down about 170 watts. And I'm gonna say that you need about comparable amounts of power to produce comparable amounts of lift using electric motors, because you just gotta put bigger blades on the motor, that sort of thing. 
Now NASA reckons that when their drones in the air, it's going to be running at about 200 watts. The power that it's going to consume, which by the way it has to generate on its own through the solar panels and charge the batteries inside, is 220 watts. Which seems very generous, especially when you consider you only need about one third of the energy to fly on Mars that you do on Earth. Right, so the system is designed to fly for two to three minutes every day. There's a solar panel on the top, and that provides us enough energy for that short flight, as well as to keep us warm through the night. So let's see if they can actually get that power. They want 220 watts for a two minute flight every day. So they need about 26,000 joules from somewhere. The solar panel they have planned, eh, I'm pretty skeptical about that. This is a 40 watt panel. That's when it's pointing straight at the sun and tracking it for the whole day. It generates about a consistent 40 watts. But let's just say that a solar panel that tracks the sun has a 100% efficiency for comparison. Now, if you don't track the sun, you just have a fixed solar panel, then you lose about half of that potential. That is, your solar panel is now operating only at 50% relative efficiency. And if you light flat on the ground, as you would in say road, you're now down to about 30% efficiency. By this simple act, of geometrically laying these panels down flat on the ground, you are throwing away about 60%, two thirds of their potential power generating capability. And what's true for solar roadways here on Earth is also true for solar panels on drones on Mars. So if this solar panel were actually on the drone, it would generate about a third of its maximum power, which averaged over the daylight hours is about 13 watts. However, you know, the sun's only in the sky for half of the day, so averaged over the whole day, it only on average produces about 7 watts. Then, of course, you're on Mars. So Mars only gets about one half the solar flux that you get at Earth, meaning that your solar panels will generate about half of this power. So you're now looking at an average continuous power from a solar panel this size of about 3 watts on a typical Martian day. So given that a Martian day and an Earth day are almost exactly the same length, this means that over a whole day, a panel like this, on average, would produce some quarter of a million joules. That's about 10 times what they need for their two minute flight, or alternatively, to get only the right amount for their two minute flight, they would need a solar panel about one tenth of this size, which seems about right for what they have in their designs. That being said, I'm still really skeptical. They're not out of the woods yet. You see, if I was a guessing man, I'd say that when the temperature drops, the batteries or some other critical components freeze. And that's good night, sweet prince, for your helicopter. Now, NASA's not idiots. They're gonna coat this whole thing with insulation. Um, thermal design, we don't, this is not an accurate design, just giving you an idea that inside the chassis you see, right, we have the aerogel, but inside all the electronics are actually in a very small cube. I think it's about a seven centimeter per side cube. So all the chips, all the batteries, um, so the gyros, excels, all of that have to fit in there. But you've still got to heat it as it leaches the heat out. And that requires power because if your helicopter freezes, it's dead. And on the flip side of this, when the thing's running, when it's actually in the air, it's generating heat like crazy, running CPUs and so forth. And now the whole thing is covered in insulation, there's nowhere to dump the heat. So this thing may well be walking a heat flow tightrope. Now, I'm sure there are several fairly simple workarounds. You can just add some thermal mass to give it some thermal inertia. But that makes the whole thing heavier. And bear in mind that this whole thing has to weigh less than about a kilo. Further, I've got doubts that they can reduce the power consumption this much. I mean, the thing sits on the ground for almost the entire day, bleeding away heat the whole time. And it's got to do some fairly heavy calculations to fly itself and land, as well as the need to transmit data. This whole device, even if it had a solar panel on it this size, has to run on about three watts. That's only enough energy to continuously run a light bulb like this. Now, the biggest panel they can probably mount on this quadcopter is a third of this size. They're looking at probably trying to run this whole thing on one watt of continuous power, which if you take a look at the most recent mock-ups, seems to be about what they've gone for, a panel about one third the size of my 40 watt panel here on Earth. 
which will probably be the most ambitious part of the project, to continuously power a craft like this of just one watt. I mean, just for reference, the Spirit and Opportunity Rovers, at their prime, were producing about 30 watts of power continuously. And the Curiosity Rover, which had a radioisotope generator, pulled in some 100 watts of electrical power. I'm skeptical you're going to be able to keep this system alive with that sort of power. So I've got lots of experience in flying drones in difficult places. In fact, believe it or not, I was actually really into flying drones uh, some time ago when you actually had to make them yourself. drone absolutely won't be doing is doing any interesting flying whatsoever it's going to be straight up across and down again nothing fancy nothing risky because you can't just put it together again if it crashes there will be absolutely no flying like this so can they do it uh, maybe will it have a long life probably not Rovers are relatively simple. They have got lots of load carrying capacity and plenty of time to make decisions at one centimeter per minute. For this helicopter, I reckon they've got coin flipping chances of being able to solve the power issue within the weight requirements. Another coin flipping chance that it will never make it to Mars in a flyable condition. And even if it gets there, I reckon you've got coin flipping type chances that it won't last longer than a week. Risky as hell, which is also pretty much NASA's assessment. It's high risk, high reward stuff, but it all checks out. There's nothing clearly stupid here. So yeah, from immediate skepticism about this NASA helicopter, after running the numbers, it more or less checks out. Now I reckon I'm gonna need a bigger solar panel, eh, probably about three times this size, because honestly I just can't see them running all of this on an effective continuous power supply of less than one watt. Although I would give NASA a word for advice, you know, as someone who's got some modest experience flying craft like this, seal the motors. Else the very powerful neodymium magnets in those motors tend to pick up the magnetic dust. Um, you know, it sort of lost power, um, and of course you can't hear whether the motor's running or not because of the roar of the sea, so I was doing a nice even flyby of the whatever and it started losing power when I tried to put power and nothing happened, at which point you're screwed because if you try and turn you lose altitude and, well, anyway, it managed to land out of the sea, but a wave then came in and waxed it. So why did this happen? Well, I think part of the clue comes from the type of sand. So this is what a normal motor should sound like. Yeah? And this is what the motor sounds like on the one that crashed. And if you actually look in to the motor, what you actually find is it's coated with black sand and you can't wash it off to save your life it's magnetic black sand and when they pick up enough of it the motor fails and your craft crashes 
And if you're in a kind of dusty environment, it's maybe something you should think about. Gotta admit, I would also replace that solar panel from a plate to a mild cone. Because a plate, the dust will just accumulate on it and the solar panel will lose efficiency. If, however, it's a gentle cone, sure, you'll lose some efficiency on the solar panel. But on the upside, every time the drone flies, the dust will shake off the cone. Meh, just a thought. But that's the way it is. Many times in science, it's not the destination but the journey. I think there are places in the solar system where it would be absolutely fantastic for helicopters, Titan being one of them. You know, because it's about the size of the moon, so it's got very low gravity and quite a thick atmosphere. The downside is, of course, how would you power it? Because out at Saturn, you're about 10 times further away from the sun than the Earth. So by the time you get out to Saturn, there's only about one hundredth of the solar flux. And would there be any pioneers proposing to explore the solar system using solar panels out as far as Saturn? Oh, wildly enough, yes, there is. This system really gives, gives you freedom to go anywhere you want in the greater solar system. So you can actually travel out to the Kuiper Belt, to the Earth cloud. Um, I wouldn't recommend this for um, interstellar journeys. But uh, this, uh, this, this basic system, provided we have filling stations along the way, um, is, means full access to the entire greater solar system. So. This is what bugs me. I took a look at this helicopter project with all sorts of skepticism, but it more or less all checks out. It's not fundamentally stupid. Picturing your spacecraft out at Saturn using solar panels is just fundamentally stupid. It doesn't even pass high school levels of inspection. You know, if these solar panels generate some 200 kilowatts when they're by the Earth, that means that by the time they get out to Saturn, they're generating about 2 kilowatts of power, meaning that you have to sustain everyone on that spaceship with less than the power it takes to run a kettle. But it gets worse than that, because at the end of his presentation, he shows people getting off his magnificent spaceship onto Europa. The uh, problem with that is Europa is right in the middle of Jupiter's screamingly radioactive Van Allen belts. Within hours, everyone there would experience radiation sickness, and within about 12 hours, they would have all been fatally exposed to radiation. And you just look like kind of a melon who doesn't really know what they're talking about when you then go on to explain how radiation in space isn't that big of a deal in Mars or elsewhere. Uh, sure. I, I mean, the, the, my view on the radiation thing is that there's certainly some risk of radiation, um, but it's not, it's not, um, it's not deadly. Um, there'll be some slight increased risk of, uh, of, of cancer, uh, but it's, it's, I think, relatively minor. When you're sat in front of a picture where everyone traveling on your solar system exploring rocket has just been exposed to a fatal dose of radiation. So I actually think the radiation thing is, is, is um, it's often brought up, but I think it's not, not uh, too big of a deal. So if you enjoyed that, give this video a thumbs up. And for more like it, hit the subscribe button. And if you really like this video, you can support this channel directly through Patreon. And I'll leave the links below.